welcome back to the Thinking Progressive Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Rivers. It's September 27th, 2019, and in this week's progress report, we're going to take a deep dive into Bernie Sanders' new wealth tax he's just proposed and Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez's A Just Society Plan, a suite of bills designed to enhance worker protection in the United States. Thanks so much for tuning into the Thinking Progressive Podcast. So this past week, Bernie Sanders released his plan for a wealth tax that would cut the wealth of billionaires in half over the next 15 years. His objective is to spend the revenue on funding social programs such as affordable housing, universal child care, and Medicare for all. Before diving into the details of the plan, we should start by clearing the air with some facts about wealth concentration in the United States. Every single president, that's every single one, since Richard Nixon, has enacted policies to transfer wealth from the lower and middle classes to the wealthiest Americans. In 1970, the marginal tax rate for the 0.01% was over 75%. Today, in 2019, it's 37%. Given the transfer of wealth, it's no surprise that over the past 30 years, the top 1% has seen a $21 trillion increase in its wealth compared to the bottom half of American society, which has lost $900 billion in wealth. Every administration has been complicit. Democrat or Republican, it doesn't matter. They have all worked for corporations and the uber-wealthy first, Americans second. A U.S. Census Bureau report studying poverty over the last 70 years shows us that an additional 7 million people have been put in poverty since the year 2000. Bernie's plan is undoubtedly a progressive tax in terms of ideology, but it isn't traditional progressive taxation, and I want to kind of break that language apart for a moment. What differentiates this from most taxes that we're used to is that it's based on an individual or couple's total net worth, essentially the value of everything they have. When we typically hear progressive taxation, it refers to a sliding scale tax of income. So again, Bernie's tax focuses on net worth, not income. That's important because the most traditional progressive income taxation that we normally have lacks any real impact. And and really all it does is make it a a class issue, right? Whose interest is being served above the others? Uh, So Bernie's plan starts with a 1% tax on net worth above $32 million for a married couple. Uh, And that means a married couple with a $32.5 million would be taxed on that additional 0.5 million, right? That 500,000 and pay a wealth tax of $5,000. The tax rate then increases to 2% for net worths of 50 to 250 million, uh, 3% on 250 to 500 million, 4% on the 500 million to a billion, 5% on 1 to 2.5 billion, 6% on 2.5 to 5 billion, uh, 7% on 5 to 10 billion, and then 8% on wealth over 10 billion. Um, and these thresholds that I've just given you, they're all for couples. You would cut the threshold at half. So you'd cut the, you know, the taxation would stay the same for half the amount of dollars for a single person. The only other candidate who's put out a similar plan is Elizabeth Warren. But if we contrast those two plans, we see that Elizabeth Warren's plan would add a 2% annual tax on net worth above 50 million and a 3% tax on net worth above 1 billion. So Bernie's tax uh, extracts much more wealth from the uber wealthy than Warren's does. Bernie's plan also increases funding for the IRS to enforce existing and newly proposed tax laws. It includes mandatory audits of billionaires and a 40 to 60% exit tax for uber wealthy individuals who attempt to expatriate or flee, right, the country to avoid these new taxes. Funding the IRS is, is one of the most unexciting progressive policies to come out of Bernie's campaign but it's also one of the most impactful. The IRS has been consistently defunded and recent policy changes have the IRS focusing audits on low income people over high income people. To to put it another way, our tax dollars, we are paying taxes to audit poor people. Funding the IRS is a way to enforce new and existing tax laws for the country's highest earners and prevent them from utilizing tax loopholes to hide their cash. The last paragraph of Bernie's tax plan talks about how his wealth plan isn't radical and compares his wealth tax to property tax, essentially arguing that for the vast majority of Americans, property tax is a wealth tax. He concludes by sharing that the majority of wealth held by the top 0.01% is not in property assets, making property tax disproportionately a middle and low income tax. 
that's a pretty strong argument and one that I'm undoubtedly going to be adding to my repertoire for future conversations uh, because I've really never thought of property tax as a wealth tax, but it totally is. Thinking progressively about this assertive wealth tax, it's a massive step in the right direction. Look, at the end of the day, a free society cannot exist within a class structure. Investments in social, technological, and infrastructure projects require capital. An economic arrangement that allows wealth to be concentrated so significantly among so few is both unsustainable and undesirable. Therefore, society bears the right and the responsibility to redistribute that wealth when needed. Now, some may argue that this type of wealth redistribution is unconstitutional, and that isn't true. Article 1, Sections 8 and 9 of the Constitution discuss taxation and the government's ability to assign new taxes. Section 9 talks about how no direct tax may be assigned without a proportional assessment of the people of the state. What it is, is it's really a relic of slavery in the Three-Fifths Compromise, and it's something that we're going to have to grapple with as progressives in fighting to pass this legislation. Fortunately, multiple professors have already argued that there is no legal or functional reason to have a wealth tax applied proportionally by state. Unfortunately, the packing of the Supreme Court and, and courts throughout the United States with conservative partisan judges creates an obstacle that may artificially stall or prevent the legislation from becoming a reality. Now, redistributive taxation is a fine start, but progressives must not allow it to become an end. Equality of circumstance is not our goal. The structural transformation of the economy and politics is. Most of the time, when we hear about new taxation, it acts as a retreat from the effort required to actually reshape our economic institutions. I compare it to putting a Band-Aid on a wound that requires surgery. Where Bernie's plan stands out above the rest is that his taxation is generating capital for the transformation of institutional arrangements of our society. By beginning the process of expansion into a more in-depth suite of vital protections such as healthcare, socialized energy production, and a jobs guarantee, the Sanders team is starting the real work of systemic reformation. That's something that every progressive should be very excited about. Now we'll move on to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's A Just Society package of bills. This past week, she released her A Just Society, a series of measures designed to address economic injustice. One of my favorite books is The Spirit Level by Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. I highly recommend you read it. It focuses on the data showing how wealth inequality is one of the most damaging aspects of our society. It negatively impacts our physical and mental health. It lowers our trust in one another. It decreases our lifespan, among others. I mean, we also know that the United States is the most unequal country in the world. Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez's plan is a definite step towards addressing one of America's most embarrassing flaws. I've read all the bills, and we're going to kind of break each one down now and give you a summary so you have a better understanding of what she's pushing forward. The Recognizing Poverty Act focuses on redefining poverty. Language matters, and so does context. As the nature of work in our economy shifts, we need to redefine our traditional institutions and measurements to reflect our circumstances better. The bill will adjust the federal poverty line to take into account geographic cost variations, uh, health insurance costs, work expenses for families, childcare, and new necessities, for example, like internet access. What I love most about this is the aspect of redefining. Redefining is a practice that we are going to need to adapt more in the future to the advancements of technology, knowledge, and the changing nature of our economy. AOC's bill proposes an annual redefinition. So I love it. It's, it's the constant, you know, as progressives, we must subject our government to constant challenge and change. We need a government that evolves at the same pace of society, uh, and currently our existing structure does not do that. Moving on, the Place to Prosper Act focuses on protecting renters, improves the quality of available housing, diminishes the power of corporate landlords, and seeks to ensure accessible and affordable housing for all people. The bill limits the ability for landlords to increase residential rents and ties increases to the overall consumer price index for urban consumers or 3% of the average monthly paid for the same unit each month, whichever is greater. It includes language to protect tenants from frivolous evictions, voids lease provisions that would prevent tenants from pursuing civil action against a landlord who breaks the contract, and punishes landlords who repeatedly offend. 
The bill also includes $6.5 billion per year to help states provide tenants with legal counsel and requires 85% of the money to be spent on direct tenant impact. Finally, it stops large residential real estate firms from receiving any government assistance for any and all new home acquisition or building. The Place to Prosper Act seems designed to empower low-income tenants and to strike at predatory landlords, which is a good start. It's a concentrated effort to ensure that our tax dollars don't support the ultra-wealthy. Now, we can imagine that beyond this immediate bill is a longer-term vision to begin unraveling residential rent-seeking as a viable method of capitalization. In other words, having a system where people's homes are seen as profit centers for owners is bad for society. There are numerous benefits to home ownership, both as a store of wealth for the individual and for the mental well-being of the individual and their children. Progressives should be focused on securing housing as a human right, no exceptions. Having a stable and secure place to call home is a precursor to self-actualization for many people. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean ownership in the traditional sense. Our goal isn't to give away homes for people to sell. Instead, we could create land trusts of residential dwellings that are blocked near certain specific industrial verticals. When receiving a home, you are contractually obligated to maintain it via proper upkeep in exchange for sole use rights. We redefine the definition of ownership. You own the space as long as it's your residence. If you change the direction of your life for whatever reason, you give the home back to the state for reassignment and you take a new home in a location of your choice. Housing as a right is not the total abolishment of private property. That should not be the aim of, pro of the progressive. That should not be the aim of the progressive. Having privately owned property does allow people to pursue work, research, and activities that might otherwise not have a place in present society. Progressives understand that innovation comes in many forms and directions, and we do not want to stifle it. What it does mean is that we create new laws of property and contracts specific to these publicly owned units. How they ultimately take form is, is really up to us. I imagine networks of kind of green condo complexes with microgrids that are comfortable but not necessarily luxurious. Moving on, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez's Embrace Act is intended to expand social safety nets to all people regardless of immigration status. It's a pretty straightforward bill. If you are in the United States, you are now eligible to pay into and receive the same social benefits as anyone else. The Embrace Act is a step towards dialing a more progressive moral compass. It's pretty straightforward. We value all humans regardless of birth lottery. As someone who's had access to significant privilege due to my race, gender, and socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, I recognize that this is one of the most essential aspects of AOC's package. It is a willing evolution of our consciousness, the recognition of a universal oneness and the latent potential of every individual. I imagine this bill is going to upset a lot of conservatives, but their arguments against it are contradictory. You want immigrants to assimilate, speak English, and become law-abiding citizens and to produce, but in the same breath, you want to deny them the essential services and rights that all humans have in the United States. You can't have it both ways. If you're genuine about helping immigrants become Americans, you'll support the bill. I also want to clear up some common misconceptions. It's a common but incorrect belief that immigrants don't pay taxes and that this bill would be using our collective tax resources to subsidize them. It's just not true. Many immigrants pay the same taxes that you and I do. The big difference? They can't claim the benefits of these services that you and I can. The fourth bill is, is pretty similar to that third bill. It's called the Mercy and Reentry Act, and it applies the same social protections to people with criminal convictions uh, as the Embrace Act does for immigrants. Much of the same logic applies. We're talking about human beings, right? So if we believe in humanity's ability to transcend, to be better than we are, then we recognize that no person deserves to be forever bound to their worst moment in history. If we want offenders to reintegrate into society and be productive members of society, we need to provide them with the necessary resources to do that. Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez's fifth bill, the Uplift Our Workers Act, focuses on tying federal contracts to businesses with high degrees of worker friendliness. Evaluated through a set of criteria such as paid family leave, consistent scheduling, a $15 minimum wage with paid overtime, and union membership. The scoring system, which would be developed in the 18 months following the passage of the bill, would be the determining factor in the decision-making process. 
The bill puts a lot of pressure on organizations to develop and document their processes to be more worker friendly. What I appreciate about this bill is that it challenges the notion that our economy is some single and monolithic structure that acts as a unique force. Time and time again, we have witnessed companies fail to act on behalf of their workers and employees, GM cutting the healthcare of their striking employees being one incredibly recent and incredibly sad example. It's up to the people of the United States to ensure that we build a society that prioritizes the transformative potential of our people over the profits of a select few. If businesses choose not to do the right thing on their own, public legal coercion is necessary. Now, this bill only impacts companies applying for federal grant money, aka our tax dollars, to fund their projects. It is because they are entering contracts directly with the people that we have the power to dictate the terms of their employment. As progressives, we must realize and recognize that wage labor is just a different form of class slavery. Our objective is to construct a society based on free labor. This isn't a unique or new idea. Karl Marx and Abraham Lincoln and, and others all recognize free labor as the superior form of labor. What modern liberals have forgotten is that wage labor was intended to be a transitory phase in American history. The difference is that in present society, we do have the capabilities to begin a genuine transition into a free labor economy, but we lack the political willpower. Small but consistent efforts like the Uplift Our Workers Act will help to continue to move the bar further and further towards a free labor economy. Finally, the sixth act in the plan is to have the United States ratify the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. The ICESCR states that all people have a right to work and to have those working conditions be fair and just to social security and an adequate standard of living, including food, clothing, housing, and healthcare. This is precisely where the progressive movement needs to be going. Deepening global cooperation is essential to outgrow the antiquated nation state model that currently confines us and limits our options for transcendence. An increasingly unified vision of human rights allows us to build a network where the individual's opportunity to change their circumstance is greatly accelerated. Beyond global cooperation, it is another step to codify the extension of human rights, which will help dictate the direction of our economic, legal, and social organization. Overall, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez's plan is a series of small steps towards a new direction of what it means to be human in 2019. While they lack deep structural reform, we have to recognize that change is piecemeal and that the most significant visions are accomplished with small steps in the right direction. That wraps up this week's Thinking Progressive Progress Report. As always, I provide a number of sources where I'm drawing information from and encourage you to check them out on your own. I do this so you can feel confident in the analysis and theory that I'm putting forth here in the Thinking Progressive Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Thinking Progressive Podcast. If you haven't already, please take a moment to subscribe to our channel and like this video. At the Thinking Progressive Podcast, we always try to bring you news and information from a deeper philosophical perspective, less sound bites, more reflection. Your support matters and will help us to keep the content coming. Once again, I'm your host, Ron Rivers, and I'll see you next week.